we're finally here. The last video for basic concept number four, part three. In this video, we're going to implement the math we learned from the previous video, concept number four, part two. All that cross product and signed area stuff, we're all gonna implement all that good stuff in VEX. Then we'll enhance our code to do a little bit more. We're going to use a simple math trick and pinpoint if the object is in front of our robot or behind our robot. After going over all the basics on the background math for cross products and how we came up with using signed area formula, which is just deter the determinant of our two by two square matrix to get a clear value indicating left, right, or straight, which is the position of this sphere in terms of where it's standing to a, our little robot in the middle, this diamond pyramid robot. So it's left, right. It's a little hard to get that straight because it has to be exactly like dead on in the middle, which we'll fix a little later on. So I'm gonna add a threshold to the straight detection, to detecting the straight, because right now it needs a dead on, uh, a zero value from the signed area, which is a little hard to get using the mouse in the viewport due to some rounding uh, that's happening behind the scenes here. But here we are now, ready to continue where we left off from the previous video, and we can now finish the implementation on this robot and sphere project. So where we left off was here on the cross product in this wrangle down here. So this is the piece of code that was implemented in the previous video, and we're gonna continue on from there and complete the rest of this project. The limitation of this snippet of code couldn't tell us the direction of the sphere in relation to the robot. Is it on the left of the robot or on the right of the robot? We derived that signed area formula to get us a clear negative or positive values to indicate if it's on the left or on the right or straight. And this is the formula implemented right here from that signed area formula. The first component, which is the X value of the front direction of the robot, multiplied by the z value of the uh, sphere, and then the x value of the sphere, multiplied by the z value of the robot. And subtracting these two products, you'll get what I call here a cross area. If the cross area is negative, I create a string and I simply give it a value left. Now let's just try this out. So let's come down here, select the cross, now I have the render flag down here, which is so we can actually see the robot and the sphere in the viewport. But you can also keep the render flag down here, but highlight this node here. And what the geometry spreadsheet will be displaying will be the information from what our highlighted node is. So we have this one selected. And let's go over to the geometry spreadsheet down here. Now let's go into the details and we'll see, actually I need to pull this up. So we'll see that the cross area value is right here. So there's the cross area value. We have a negative 4.78803. This is a negative value. In order to know if the sphere is on the left or the right side of the robot, I just need to know if it's negative or if it's positive. So right now the sphere is on the left side of the robot and the cross area is negative. Here's the condition we have. We put an if statement condition, if condition, and we're going to compare it and see if it's less than zero. So that means it's negative. And it also means it's on the left side. So I'm updating the string. So this S here means that we're writing a string into the geometry spreadsheet. That is an attribute called dir, which stands for direction. Now what happens if it's on the right side? To the right, let's move the sphere to the right. Okay, and highlight our cross node here so we can see all that data in the geometry spreadsheet. And let's take a look at that cross area value. We are getting a 3.77406 and indeed it is positive. So this is the next else if statement. So else if means that if this first if statement is not satisfied, so that means it's not less than zero, it's not negative, then we go to the next condition, which will go else if, okay, I want you to test one more thing. 
another condition if the first one doesn't satisfy it, it it didn't work out so the cross area is greater than zero which means it's positive which it is at the moment then we're going to update that string and with the label right so that's what you see right here in the labeling in this little text in the viewport and of course in the end if it's not left or right then before we implement the straight ahead and behind detection we need to do one more thing. It's really hard to get this dead on straight in order to detect the straight. So what I'm gonna do is add a threshold to our cross to our cross wrangle here. And instead of detecting the exact zero value from the cross area variable, I'm gonna say if it's close to zero, so plus or minus a value of 0.1. As long as it's close to zero, we're gonna say it's straight. So I'm gonna move this last condition, which is where we have our straight. And I'm gonna move it to the top. That will be the first thing to detect. We want it to be the first thing because the next two conditions where it detects the plus and minus over zero, those are gonna get in the way. We need to detect that threshold first. And then if it doesn't work out for the threshold, that means it's not straight, then we can detect on positive negative values. That way it won't get out of, in the way. So we're gonna go another if condition, but this time I want the absolute value of the cross area. So I'm gonna use ABS, which is the absolute. At this moment, I don't really care if it's negative or positive in order to, to detect the straight value. I want a value that is close to zero. The absolute value of the cross area, F at cross area. Now that will give us a scalar value. And as long as it's less than 0.1, and I'm gonna close it off. So this is our condition. Right here, this is our condition. If the cross area, the absolute value is less than one. It doesn't matter if it's negative 0.05 or positive 0.05. We're gonna consider that as straight. I'm gonna have to change the second condition to be an else if. So the second condition needs to be an else if now. This way, if the first condition does not satisfy, it's not straight, then we can move on to the next condition. If we left it as an if, like this, it would be a brand new condition. Like it would detect this again, even if the first condition would satisfy. But we don't want that because there's only one value. The direction can only have one value. So you only want to detect this once. If it's straight, it's straight. If it's left, it's left then we need that else if. That guarantees that we only have one answer. Now let's give this a try. Let's give this a run. Let's move that sphere and make it close to, okay, now it's so much easier to get that straight now since we have that offset, we have that point one offset. Let me pop this window out. So we can always have this floating around. Now I'm gonna move this around and I'm gonna move it to the back. Okay, straight. So it's still a little hard. 0.1 is not a large number, it's a very small number. So it, it's still tricky to get that straight value. So what I'm gonna do is create a variable to adjust this 0.1. So sometimes we might want 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Well, I want this adjustable. So what I'm gonna do here, take this out and I'm gonna go CHF, I'm gonna go threshold close the bracket. What this does is that it'll channel in a float. So that's what the CH means. It'll channel in a parameter value. What type of parameter? A float. That's what the F is for. And what's our parameter name? It'll be threshold. Usually you would have to come to this little gear here and create the parameter and all that stuff, but there's actually a shortcut. So after you type this into the wrangle text box, press this little button over here, so it'll all automatically create the threshold parameter right there. So that's very handy. Beats going into that gearbox. And now that we're back to uh, one, so uh, back to zero. So let's make this point 0.5 just to see if it's working. So now the th we've increased the threshold to detect the straight. It should be a lot easier to move this now. Yep, it is indeed a lot easier. So we're getting straight so much easier. So this might be something you want. This 
could be you could have it fixed but i like having this flexibility of controlling it okay now that we fixed the sensitivity of the straight detection we need to know if it's straight in front or straight behind in order to detect if the sphere is in front or behind the robot, we're going to take a bit of sidetrack into collinear vectors. What we do know out of this uh, little project from what we have at the moment is that the vector of our sphere, our rel relative vector of our sphere, has the same slope and is parallel to the front vector of the robot. So let's take move this to the top view that vector over there, that's the front vector of the robot. I'm going to move our sphere so that it's a little more straight. Because when now we've implemented that threshold offset, so it doesn't have to be dead on straight in order to, to detect the straight. But here, I will show you that it is straight. It's still straight. It's just that, so it was a little off, but for this example, I need it dead on. Our vector of the sphere is parallel to the vector of the front vector of the robot. They're both parallel. That's how we know it's straight. So we know both of these vectors are collinear. What we do not know is if the sphere is in front or behind the robot. Can be over here in front of the robot. And now our vectors would look like this. Now, if the sphere was in front of the robot and both vectors are parallel, if we take the front vector, which is the blue vector you see on the screen right now, and we multiply it to a scalar value, it doesn't matter what that value is. It, it's uh, n. It's an unknown number for now. We know we can get the orange vector by multiplying a scalar value to the blue vector because they're collinear. For example, now, in order to illustrate this, I'm going to create a little rough note. So let's move this aside. Both of the blue and yellow vectors you see here are parallel and collinear. If we multiply a scalar value to the blue vector, we get the yellow vector. How is this possible? It's because both vectors have the same direction, but different magnitudes. The lengths are different. The yellow vector is actually double the blue vector. So we know. If we multiply 2 to the blue vector, we'll get the yellow vector. Now let's see what happens if we multiply negative 1 to the blue vector. We'll get a flipped version of the blue vector, but they are still parallel, sitting on the same line. We can use this. When a vector is positioned behind the blue vector, we get a negative scalar multiple. And when the vector is positioned in front of the blue vector, we get a positive scalar multiple. However, there's always a but. We don't know what the scalar multiple is in our robot and spheres project. We know the robot's front vector and the spheres relative vector to the robot, but that's it. Now this is where I do a bit of cheating and use some algebraic equation solving to help me figure out what the unknown scalar value is. Let's just focus on the x values of both vectors and write down what we know. 1, which is the x value in the blue vector multiplied by n, will get, us the, will get us 2, which is the x value in the yellow vector. Now we have an equation, and now we can solve for n. What is n? n is equal to 2. Our scalar multiple is positive. So what's in front? Let's do another example, where the yellow vector is behind the blue vector. 1 which again is the x value in the blue vector is multiplied by n, our unknown. That will get us negative 1, which is the x value in the yellow vector. Now we solve for n. n is equal to negative 1. Our scalar multiple is negative, so we got our behind. We now have a formula. We can take the x value from the yellow vector and divide it by the x value from the blue vector in order to solve for the scalar multiple. Let's get back to the vex code with what we now know. We're going to add a bit of code to this, the first if statement. That's when we know it satisfies the threshold and it is straight. We know that it's straight, then we know it's parallel and it's in the same direction. So we're in the right moment, we're in the right state. And what we need is curly braces. What these curly braces do is that if this first condition satisfied, 
run all the code inside the curly braces. That's all this stuff here. Now we want to add an extra condition. If it is straight, we want to know if it's behind or in front. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab the X value on both the front vector and the other point vector, which is this, the relative sphere vector. So we're going to grab the X value for both of them at front. This is the X component of the robot, the front vector, the other point vector, which is the sphere relative sphere vector. And we divide it by our robot vector. We're going to get a scalar value. We're going to get that the scalar value that we want. And I'm going to call that factor. Now, if this factor is positive, that means it's heading in the same. It's in front of it. It's heading. It, it's a multiple of uh, the blue vector, the robot vector. It's in front of the robot. So we're going to go if factor greater than zero. Then what we want to do is append uh, a front to our string direction. So let's grab our string at dir. So that's our string attribute. And we're just going to append something. So plus equals is like a shortcut operator by appending something. We're going to append front. So what it'll read, it'll read straight space front. Else if, because we need to the back as well. Else, if the factor is greater, less than zero, we're going to append a back to it. And let's see how this all works out. Let's go back to perspective. OK, it, we can see it working already straight for, uh, front. But let's move it to the back. Let's move this sphere to the back. OK, looks like it's working. I hope you all find this mini series helpful. I'm hoping to get started on more practical examples illustrating the full potential of all these techniques I've shown so far for cross product. The next video still in the works will hopefully demonstrate the cross product in simulations or in animations like the intro title screen at the beginning of this video. Thanks for watching and sticking to the end.